we've endured, but I think it speaks to the certainty that we have come to a time when people are now hungry for a new truth. And I think that there's a recognition that what is represented here by this gathering and by this gathering of African minds is that there is a dawning of a new reality for African people. And you, all of you who have endured what you have endured over the last couple of days, represent that yearning and that aspiration for that new truth which already is here anyway, and a recognition that it is now time for us to recognize, come into the consciousness, and claim what is in fact our own. The time is extremely short. Those of you who've heard me before know I ramble on for hours like other friends we have around here. And I'm certainly going to be as disciplined as I possibly can tonight and to be as precise and concise as I possibly can. I'd like to suggest that the elaboration of some of the ideas that we are talking about are available on some of the tapes that may be just a few of them left uh, outside at one of the tables right at the turn of the corner, uh, particularly one from the Nile Valley Conference in Atlanta from two years ago, and one from the uh, Dallas, Texas Black Awakening Conference that's called the Asarian Myth in Black Awakening. And both of those give more details about what I'm going to have to deal with tonight in a very perfunctory way. And I hope that you'll forgive me and hopefully we'll make those things, those tapes available to yourselves if you can. If not, contact me and I can let you know how to get them. I want to do two things. First of all, I want to just talk about the difference between comedic science and what we have come to know as science. The second thing I'd like to do is to talk about <clears throat> what is the foundation of comedic science and what then becomes the implication for investigation within that scientific discipline from that perspective. Now, one of the things that is vital is for us to understand that as uh, Dr. Amos Wilson and Dr. Karinga and many other people have already said, is that what we are talking about is a new conception of what the pursuit of knowledge is actually all about. In doing that, we have to understand that we have been systematically brought into an approach that at its best handicaps us for pursuing science in the way which we are suggesting is now appropriate. It's important to understand that those of us who have been most extensively trained in Western thought are probably the least qualified to move into this new purview simply because of the limitations on our thinking. We are handicapped by a, concept, a set of conceptualizations that the Western world has already given us. So the most that we can do is to struggle with our handicaps and to hopefully begin to breed a new form of thinking in those of you who have not yet gotten imbued with this heavy burden of Western madness so that you can in fact begin to open yourself to the kind of thinking that's necessary. Number one, comedic science is only partially rational in the sense that we understand rationality. It is simultaneously rational, emotional, and spiritual. That means then that the essential criteria for what is correct, the essential criteria for what is knowledge, the essential criteria for understanding what is to be understood cannot be utilized utilizing the primary vehicle to which we've been accustomed, and that is logic and rationality. That is only one of the criteria. A part of assessing the legitimacy of knowledge has to do with how you feel about it. It has to do with what your grandmama used to talk about, whether or not you feel it in your bones or not. Whether or not there's an intuitive basis that confirms what the rational implication might be. So if something makes rational sense, but it doesn't make intuitive sense, and then it makes you feel bad, then it probably is not legitimate knowledge. And one must begin to understand how to integrate, listen, how to integrate all of those dimensions in order to be able to understand what really is. Therefore, when we begin to talk about understanding the knowledge of ancient Kemet, we are not talking about a phonetic system 
when we talk about the meadow netter, when we begin to talk about how do we begin to understand the language, we are not simply talking about memorizing in a rote way this line means the phonetic sound of a ba, a boo, a ka, or whatever. That line means a phonetic thing. That line means an affective thing. That line means a spiritual thing. And the brilliance of the comedic science is that it was able to collapse all of those dimensions into the same symbolic reality. So when you go through the temples, when you go through the pyramids, when you go through the tombs, when you expose yourself to that kind of science or the results of the comedic science, even if you don't know one word in the language, it speaks to you in levels of your being that you may not know that you know. What happens with many people who have visited in those parts of the world, please, I don't have but a couple of minutes, thank you. In the, if you visit in those parts of the world, you begin to understand, you begin to feel something even when you don't know what you're feeling. Those of us who have traveled in Kemet, we know that as we moved around Karnak and Luxor and the other places in the, into, the, into the Valley of the Kings and so forth, even though we were not sure what was on the wall, something was happening to us. We were being transformed by the exposure to the symbols that were there. That means then that the rationality Beginning to approach it rationally is only one aspect of the learning which must occur. That's the characteristic, that's a characteristic of the comedic science. By the way, in much the same way, our conferences, our scholarly interactions are not only rational and academic, they are also revival meetings. They are also spiritual gatherings. We don't just come to get ideas, we come to feel good. And we don't apologize about that. We don't come to just communicate concepts. One of the things that I understand about African-American con uh, conferences as opposed to uh, European conferences is that we don't sit here and just transmit ideas. We transmit feelings. And if the feelings don't come across, we feel we didn't get any information. In fact, if people give good ideas and no feelings, you go to sleep on them because that's the nature of the dual thing. So the idea is, is that the concepts for comedic science are already a part of our being. It's simply a matter of recognizing what we do right already anyway and stop trying to imitate something that's not ourselves. And once we can be what we are, then we are well equipped to change and use what we know. Second characteristic, not only is it it, not only does the, the, the comedic science combines the rational, the emotional, and the spiritual, it also does what is referred to, uh, Vernon Dixon in one of his articles talks about diunital logic. In comedic science, things can both be and not be. They can both be the same thing and its opposite. So a particular symbol can be both male and female, right and wrong, up and down, because truth is not fragmented. Truth brings together both diametrically opposed poles and brings them into one. So when you begin to approach Western science, you have to always have a opposite thing to contrast with the thing. The concept of empirical science has a linear kind of logic, that if you have a right, you've got to have a wrong. If you've got an inferior, you've got to have a superior. So the basis of Western racism has a lot to do with the fact that the only way they could feel good about themselves was to have the dialectic, to have something to feel bad about. So if the only way they could feel competent as people was to be convinced that we were inferior as people. So they uh, predicated their superiority and their supremacy on our inferiority. That's the Western thought. That's why so much of it is on in social science, the bell-shaped curve. All of reality has to fall along a line somewhere. You've got to have as many geniuses as you have idiots. You've got to have as many normals as you have schizophrenics. You've got to have as many nuts as you have unnuts. You've got to have an equal balance on each side because the idea is everything is on a straight line that balances out of the bell-shaped curve. Western science. When you begin to approach the comedic science, looking for those kinds of linear divisions, you're going to run into problems. When you begin to look for exclusive evil and not find good, you're going to have a problem. When you begin to look for exclusive good and not find evil is a part of that, you're going to have problems. When you look for exclusive masculinity 
and not find femininity, you're going to have a problem. Because in the comedic science, all of these forces operate together. The world operates in the unity of opposites. It's cyclical rather than linear. The world moves in circles. Life moves in circles. So when one talks about the life, the developmental process, one does not talk about a beginning and an end. One talks about a cycle that continues. So one of the reasons that you find in comedic science so much emphasis on immortality, the life after death, is because the concept of death is an alien concept once you understand the cyclical, the cyclical reality. The seasons, the sun, the moon, everything moves in circles, so by implication, life itself must also move in circles. So there is no death, there are only new beginnings. Listen, the other thing that must be understood, I'm running through these very rapidly, I hate to do it, but it's got to be done. The other thing is that this idea of, 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 of knowledge in the comedic world was well exemplified by Chekanta Diop in the sense that knowledge is holistic. There's no such thing as a discipline of psychology versus physics versus biology versus botany versus linguistics. If we begin to approach comedic science in that way, we are going to have serious problems. The fact that these two days have had speakers from all kinds of traditional Western disciplines. And in Western science, we would never speak to each other. Political scientists and physicists, physicians and psychologists, social scientists and artists on the same panel talking about the same reality, impossible in the West, because the West has chopped up the world in little bit of pieces of specializations, and everybody goes off in the kitchen and cooks his pot, and that's what's called reality. In comedic science, it's all one reality. That's why Imhotep was able to be an architect, an advisor to militaries, builders of pyramids, a med medicine man, an herbalist, a philosopher, all in one lifetime, one man doing one thing, because it all came together. The nature of comedic science requires us to bring things back together and to not be paralyzed by the narrowness of disciplines that keep us separated. We must get out of the thing, the tendency to begin to feel protective of our turf. I'm a psychologist, so I have all the prerogatives to discuss to mine. What did, what, did you get your degree in psychology? What do you know about child development? Nothing. I'm a mother. I have children, lots of them, so I know more than you do. So the reality of it is, is that we must begin to understand that we all have access to all knowledge. What differs is our availability or our ability to access the knowledge that we have. But it's all there and it must all be considered in the, in the involvement. Secondly, comedic science and, and the brilliant paper by uh, uh, Jake Carruthers, which I recommend to all of you, Science and Oppression, deals with this issue. One of the hallmarks of Western science is objectivity versus subjectivity. The idea is that in order to be scientifically legitimate, you have got to pull you out of the interaction. Crap, garbage, mess, untrue, unreal. How can I be scientifically objective and I'm talking about my life? The reality of it is, is that the thing that makes comedic science real is that the scientist is a part of his science. You must be a part of what you're doing. If you do not become a part of the work, a part of the observation, then in fact you begin to obscure the total insight. Because a part of the insight is not what occurs on an external, objective basis, but what occurs internally and externally, simultaneously. And if you only see the external data, you're only getting piece of the pie and not the whole pie. So objectivity, subjectivity, they come together and require us to bring together the full magnitude of our experiences in order to understand the comedic science. It also means something else. You can't play with this stuff if you're playing. Comedic science will back up on you and beat you to death. Listen, if you try to be a hypocrite with this, it's no such thing as being the objective scientist who does not have to get involved with your material. You've got to get involved with this material. You cannot be a psychiatrist who's a nut if you are going to deal with the comedic science, as they have in the West. We've got a lot of crazy, in fact, the craziest people in the world are psychologists and psychiatrists. I know because I'm one of them. 
The reality of it is, is that that's possible in Western science. It is possible to be an expert on raising children and never have a child in Western science. Dr. Spock can be an expert on raising children because it is an objective, external, uh, non-involved tradition. In fact, all of the experts on child development, if you found out the truth, know very little about actually raising children. And the ones they raise are usually pretty dumb, crazy, and not very good examples of what they're supposed to be teaching because they believe that objective knowledge is something outside of the person. We submit to you that you cannot approach committed science unless you're willing to commit yourself to being a scientist. That's why the priests were the scientists because their lives had to be committed to developing and purifying themselves to such an extent that what they taught, they lived, and what they lived, they taught. And therefore, the two things occurred together. So that means then that hypocrisy in the comedic science begins to back up on you and will eventually begin to destroy those who are not qualified to use it. That's why education for the comedic scientists was not a few years in graduate training where you took a few courses and did a paper. It was a lifetime commitment that began early in pubescence and continued into late life because you had to grow as you explored the science. Because there was an understanding that you could access the knowledge through self-knowledge. And it was only as you grew to know you better that you could begin to know everything else. Finally, in terms of the characteristics of comedic science, it is both esoteric and exoteric. It deals always, and Dr. Karinga has talked about this very clearly, it always deals with the external, objective, technological, people talk about computers and bombs and record players and cars and transportation. All that's a part of it. It deals with that. But it also deals with the metaphysical, justice, virtue, human power, psychic energy, abstract capabilities, uh, clairvoyance, uh, the, the fleet of thought, the invisibility of thought, spiritual life, life beyond death. It's all the same thing. And that's why these mighty structures known as so-called pyramids stand as feats of architectural achievement while simultaneously standing as symbols of human transformation. So it changed people spiritually while also standing as feats of ex exoteric accomplishment simultaneously. Now, very quickly, the foundations of comedic science. Very briefly, the foundation of comedic science, again, this has been said, I want to just simply repeat it, was spiritual, but the vehicle for the spirituality was the soul. So the essential Knowledge, the pursuit of knowledge, the, the, structural, uh, the structural form through which one pursued knowledge was to study the soul, and the growth of the soul, the elucidation of the soul, the cultivation of the soul. That was the objective of all of comedic science. That's why comedic science began with the study of astrology and then became astronomy. That's why comedic science began with numerology and then became numbers and math and calculus and trigonometry. That's why masonry is sacred masonry. And that's why the masons who we have here today are doing secret stuff while not understanding the connection between the secret and the outer. The idea is that all of the scientific endeavors, be it uh, astronomy, be it medicine, be it art, be it mathematics, be it physics, be it chemistry, whatever it was, it was always connected directly to the soul. So the ancients understood that there was a universe that moved in circles. The ancients, the Dogon people, understood that there was a Saurian star system long before they got super telescopes to look out and find out the Saurian star system and how it operated. The ancients, the ones who utilized the comedic signs, were able to put on the side, of, on the interior of the tombs hundreds of years ago, the fact that there was a zodiac, zodiacal formation in the universe and there were nine planets in this solar system long before modern 
exoteric, objective astronomy discovered it. It had already been discovered through astrology because the astrology is a superior form of travel than astronomy and the explorations of the universe through the inside reveal more, more quickly, more efficiently than exploration through the universe by going to the outside. Listen, listen, listen. The challenge of the challenger. These folks were blowing themselves up, getting on top of a hydrogen bomb to go into outer space. We went into inner space. Didn't take a bomb, didn't blow up. We went in, came out with the information, and put it up there for years before they got it. Listen, 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 listen. So the superior form is the form that bases the pursuit of knowledge on the elucidation and the cultivation of the soul. When the knowledge begins to tell you more about how to grow yourself permanently, not temporarily, not materially, not superficially, not how to expand your technological capability, but how to expand your psychological, psycho in the sense of soulology, your spiritual capability, how to ensure your permanent ordering yourself with the universal principles of nature and the creator, and how to bring yourself harmoniously in accord with those processes as you pursue those goals, then all things shall be added unto it. And that's the objective, that's the occurrence, that's what happens, and that's the power of this science. That's why we must understand that we cannot run the risk of making judgments about our science based upon their limited perspectives. We have got to be bold and crazy with this science. We've got to understand that if they say it's crazy, it's probably correct. And if they say it's correct, it's probably crazy. We've got to be willing to pursue things that ordinarily don't occur together. Jake Carruthers said earlier today, in settings such as this, we, most of us who work in academic institutions with Euro-Americans, we would be laughed out of our positions of authority if they knew we were out here talking about this kind of stuff. I'm serious. They would laugh us out. If we were tenured, they would detenure us. If we were not tenured, we would never get tenured. We would be booed out as academically inefficient, ineffective, and stupid on top of it. And the idea is that there is an intentional effort to keep us away from the depth of what we have access to in utilizing the comedic science. The foundation is the search for the truth of the soul. Final point, and there's much more, but I'm going to have to stop at this one. Comedic science it's timeless and it's allegorical. It's allegorical in the sense that it takes the symbols of nature and understands the elucidation of the symbols of nature as being a statement about the growth of the soul. So the most mean, simple, debased images become exalted images of human capability and power but they all refer back to the soul. So the jackal, the jackal, a scavenger, who eats dead, dying, decaying, putrefied meats, the jackal becomes transformed into the divine netter called Anubis. And Anubis comes to symbolize allegorically the judgmental discriminating capability in the human makeup. They take the characteristics of the jackal who is able to somehow distinguish between that which is rotten and that which is too rotten to eat in order to choose what to eat of the decaying flesh, which takes a necessary fine line of discrimination. And in the comedic science, the jackal is exalted to become the guide to the scale on which the heart is weighed against the mott feather, the feather of mott, to find out if, in fact, you have been able to pass the test so that your soul is balanced by the feather. So the meanest sign, the meanest allegory, becomes an exalted image of what the human capabilities are. It goes on and on and on. We talk about Osiris and how Osiris and the conflicts between Os uh, Osiris and Seth 
and how those images begin to stand not only for the contemporary pictures of what went on between northern, uh, uh, Upper Egypt and Lower Egypt, Upper Kemet and Lower Kemet. It also talked about the conflict that goes on within the human being between what Karinga calls the ascending and the descending self and the polarities and the pull between those forces operating in the person. But it also talked about not only the contemporary picture of the political, socio-geographical realities, not only the principles of nature itself, but the principles of things yet unknown. So what we must begin to understand is that the ancient scientists were not only talking about what was true of that time, they were talking about what was going to be true of this time. So we must begin to understand, and this is the tape I recommend you're getting from Dallas, how the Osarian myth, among many other things, not only speaks of the fragmentation of the body of Osiris, a myth, not real, nobody cut nobody up in 14 pieces, nobody put him in a coffin and grew him up in a tree, nobody was, in fact, no lady came out the sky named Isis and said, I'm going to pick up all the pieces, all except his penis, which I can't find because the fish swallowed that. Nobody literally did those things. But in fact, it talked allegorically about universal truths about how people will get fragmented in times yet to be known, and they will be fragmented by forces of evil, and how Isis, the divine, tenacious, persisting power of nurturance and caring, led by Foth, the power of thought, knowledge, justice, and power, begins to bring together the fragmented pieces, listen, and bring up the resurrection. Listen, and how Osiris, who went down in the grave, buried and cut up, can come back together in one piece in a form of resurrection that you've been looking for with somebody in Palestine right around Easter time, and they are talking about you. This is the power that's available once you understand a science that is timeless. Not theories, truth. Not hypothetical constructs, truth. Power that was as real yesterday, six, seven, eight, ten thousand years ago as it is today. Finally, we must begin to understand that restoration means no more than putting back what already was. Restoration means no more than these problems that we face have already been faced and the solutions have already been found. And once we have been prepared to utilize the instruments of our science, then we can do what already has been done and get rid of the devils at the same time. Peace be unto you. We will not waste any time. We will continue to build this pyramid. Dr. Phillips. I didn't know I was going to have to follow a preacher. <laughs> We all have a direct interest in the science, art of medicine. We through our bodies are directly involved in the success of that discipline. Thank you. In the competitive, aggressive, hostile, stressful, racist society in which we live, we have a vital interest in the science, art of psychiatry. We have a cultural interest in the engineering disciplines. They produce the wonders of high technology. The VCRs, the PCs, the Walkmen, etc. But what about physics? Why should we black people, oppressed by the Reagans and Botas of the world and their constituents, be interested in modern physics? At a very fundamental level, we have a vital interest in physics. 
We are made of those elementary particles. That is a concern of physics. Our constituents are protons, neutrons, quarks, electrons, leptons. We generate electromagnetic fields in the form of heat. We absorb them in the form of light. We're just not conscious of operating. Yes. at these very fundamental levels. The physicists will say that when quantum mechanics was invented or perhaps revealed in 1925 by or to Werner Heisenberg, human life was completely understood. Why? Because chemistry was completely understood and the double helix, the DNA molecule, is a chemical structure. Our East African ancestors were co-creators co of human consciousness with Amun-Ra or Ptah two to four million years ago. Whence all humans, Chinese, Indians, Europeans, and all human activity, spiritualism, arts, sciences, are our creation. They belong to us. Our ancient comedic forebearers had great insight into the concepts of modern physics some two to 6,000 years ago. The universe is whole, is one. If we know ourselves, as our ancient African forebearers chided us to do, we know all. Supernovas, black holes, the birth and death of stars, quarks, leptons, photons, gravitons. I will pose two questions and give my answers to them in this talk. The first, why is there a relation between the general principles of ancient comedic science and modern physics. The second, can one use the approach of ancient comedic science to gain insight into modern physics? I think we know the answer to that second question. Let me say at the outset that many people have written about the relationship between ancient Eastern thought and modern physics. In books such as Zukov's The Dancing Wooly Masters, Capra's The Tao of Physics, De Rincourt's The Eye of Shiva, Eastern Mysticism and Science, R. A. Shwala de Lubitsch has written about Egyptian science in sacred science. My view of that work from the standpoint of physics is that it's very weak physics. And from the standpoint of Afrocentricism is profoundly racist. Uh, there has been, in my view, excellent work done by our panelists and Professor Van Sertema in setting straight the record of African contributions to science. Professor Papadamus has argued that Isaac Newton, Isaac Newton's work, was inspired by and based upon 
ancient black Egyptians were. My thesis is that many and probably all of the concepts of modern physics were preceded by and are based upon ancient African concepts in a general or archetypical sense. Archetypical in the sense of Carl Jung, in which these ideas are in the collective unconsciousness of the human race. The Westerners, in their attempt to overcome their intrinsic inferiority complex, caused by a lack of melanin and calcified pineal glands, have used technology in a vicious manner. They have developed science to make weapons. One such nuclear weapon was exploded today in Nevada at 11 o'clock. Uh, they have used their science to fight. I'll bet that pretty soon we'll be back, we'll be in Nicaragua fighting. They have used their science to dominate other economies. They have used their science to control the lives and deaths of non-Westerners and Western people. They've used their science to steal land. They will use their science to steal outer space. They have used their science to steal the goods on the ocean floors and to spread European genes and dogmas throughout the world. This is contrary to the original sacred intent of the original African science. The technology developed by the West, which sprung from the work that our comedic forebearers did, however, has enabled us to build the hardware used to gain a detailed knowledge about the physical domain at the atomic and subatomic levels. Refinements in technology have enabled us to quantify physical phenomena. But the concepts used to understand these phenomena are, I submit, ancient comedic concepts. Let us compare some of the ancient comedic concepts with those of modern physics. I may have the first foil, please. Now, I don't know how this is going to work, but we uh, very creative blacks will make it work. OK. Now, our comedian forebearers told us there are four qualities or four elements in the intrinsic nature of, in the intrinsic to nature. The elements are air, fire, earth, and water. The qualities are wet, dry, hot, and cold. You can find this on page 80 of uh, Professor James's text or page 448 of Black Man of the Nile by Dr. Ben. Now, may I have the next foil, please? These four elements correspond to four forces of nature. What is a force? Can, we, can you see that in the back? OK, you, you may have to push it up as I talk down the foil. Uh, no, no, no. I'm saying you may have to raise it so that people can see it as I talk. Yeah, but OK, very well. So just read along, my friend. A force is an agent that alters the velocity or of a body by changing its speed or direction. Now, since we've been involved in uh, nuclear and subatomic particles, we've had to generalize that concept of force to mean now interaction. So an interaction can change the energy or momentum or the kind among several colliding particles. Let's take a look at the forces. Next foil, please. The first force that was discovered happens to be the weakest, 
Gravitation. It acts on all matter, holds galaxies together, holds the universe together. It's negligible in the nucleus. The second force, electromagnetism, is a much stronger force. It's felt across the entire universe. And the reason why it was not as discovered before gravitation was is because of the very detailed balancing between positive and negative charges in matter. The next foil, please. The third force is a strong force that binds the particles within the nucleus together. This acts over a very short range. 10 to the minus 13 centimeters is the range of the nuclear force. The fourth force is the weak force, which is active in some radioactive decay. Now, if you read the New York Times last month, you will note that some people think that now there's a fifth force. Incidentally, the New York Times is an excellent source of scientific articles. They occur on the front page, weekly in the Science Times on Tuesday, and numerous articles in the New York Times Magazine. For instance, there was one on the 15th of September last year called To the Edge of the Universe. So, okay, there may be a fifth force. It's not established yet, but my feeling is that if it is established, we'll be able to encompass that into comedian thinking. The only similarity here is an abstract one. Now, we scientists have to abstract, not in a negative sense, but in a positive sense of moving from one level of un understanding to a next higher level, which, is, which can encompass even broader areas of knowledge. So, the relation between the ancient comedian four elements or qualities and the four forces of nature is an abstract one. Four entities are fundamental in the, res in the respective universe models, in the respective world pictures. Now let's consider the doctrine of opposites. Next foil, please. And a little physics. A page from uh, George G.M. James's Stolen Legacy. From the Egyptian mystery system about 4,000 years B.C., the doctrine of opposites is demonstrated by the double pillars in front of the temples, pairs of gods in the mystery system representing male and female, positive and negative principles of nature, Osiris and Isis, the Egyptian god and goddess, the gods Horus and Seth symbolizing a world in static equilibrium. Now, my friend, you have to raise this up, please. Okay, so that they can see it of the conflicting forces as they contend for domination over Europe. Now, question, is there an analog in modern science? Indeed, there is. Uh, the next, not the next fall, but the one after that. <clears throat> yes. In modern physics, the electron was discovered about 1879. Paul Adrian Maurice Dirac postulated the existence of a particle like the electron, but opposite in sign. So here, Dirac used the principle of, op of opposites directly. I'm not saying that he was conscious of what he did, but it certainly was in the collective unconsciousness. Now, after he postulated the positron, this positive electron, it was found. Now there's a principle of physics utilizing the pairs of opposite in all of physics, and that is all particles have their corresponding antiparticles. This is a direct use of the principle of opposite. An antiparticle has the particle has an antiparticle of a particle has the opposite charge and opposite spin of a particle. Uh, next foil please. We learned in the last presentation about what comedic science, the essence of it. Uh, presently, science is the Western version of science, which is based upon comedic science, it's, has a few stages. Not so clear when you're doing the science, but after you understand what you've done, you can 
break things down into several different categories. The first is making observations, then deriving laws, creating theories, testing theories in new domains, modifying theories when they fail. And as you may guess, they always fail. They may have to be abstracted to higher levels. The next foil, please. And you can get a very good feeling as I'll kind of go quickly through the next two foils. Uh, the electron was discovered, as I said before, in about 1789. About 1904, Thompson proposed the plum pudding model of the atom in which somehow electrons and positivity were, spirit, were smeared together. About uh, five or seven years later, Rutherford uh, devised what's called the planetary atom in which the nucleus was at the center and the electrons went around the nucleus as the planets go around the stars. Bohr, about five years after that, proposed a model in which there was a bit of quantum ideas involved. Schrodinger, about 1925, proposed another model. Now, can you raise that up a bit, please, my friend? In which the electrons are very fuzzy around the nucleus. This is quantum mechanics. At, the t at that time, people felt that only protons were in the, nutrius, in the nucleus. About 1934, neutrons were discovered, and people realized that both protons and neutrons were in the nucleus. In the 50s, people had found, we had found over 100 what we call elementary particles. Now, in 1986, we believe that all of matter consists of six leptons and six quarks. Oh, my friend, you, next foil, please. I'll have to let him know when I'm changing foils or when I want him to change foils. Okay. So, now, um, <clears throat> the last illustration of the principle of opposites is the uncertainty principle. Next foil, please. Uh, can you bring it down just slightly? Okay. The uncertainty principle. The uncertainty principle is really a profound thing. Now, this expression says delta x times delta p is greater than or equal to h bar. Now what that means is if we have complete knowledge of where a particle is located, we have no knowledge about its momentum. Momentum is the velocity of a particle times its mass. Contrarywise, if we have a complete knowledge about its momentum, we have no knowledge about where it's located. So if we have intermediate knowledge, in other words, some uncertainty about the position of a particle, the uncertainty about the momentum of that particle is limited such that the product of these two uncertainties is greater than or equal to h bar. Now another way to express the same idea is that we can talk about energy and time. The uncertainty in the energy times the uncertainty in the time is greater than or equal to the same universal constant h bar. This means if you know exactly the time some phenomenon occurs, you know nothing about its energy. Whence all energies are possible. The uncertainty principle explains why electrons don't go into the nucleus, virtual particles, the Big Bang, and it's something that Einstein didn't think was fundamental, but Einstein on this point was fundamentally wrong. Now, we have talked about the principle of Mott. Is the principle of Mott to be found in modern physics? Of course it is. The principle of Mott is a principle of balance. Something must be constant through apparent change. May I have the next foil, please? Now, this is taken from Dr. Ben's uh, great book, Black Man at the Nile, in which we see the feather being weighed against the heart. Now, is there anything like that in physics? Uh, next foil. And the answer is, of course there is. I'm showing a pendulum there. The pendulum exemplifies what we call simple harmonic motion. It's ubiquitous in all of physics. Its archetype is abstracted into quantum field theory, which is just a mixture of quantum mechanics and electricity and magnetism. Next foil, please. Now, 
uh, take a look at points one and two. Let's see if we can use the concept of Mott in understanding how the pendulum operates. At point one and point two, if I add the kinetic energy, which I symbolize by T, at point one to the potential energy at point one, I see that this equals to the kinetic energy at point two plus the potential energy at point two. Kinetic energy is simply the energy of motion. Potential energy is sim simply the energy of position. And I'm sure that we all know this. Now, the neat idea here is that they're constant. So as the pendulum swings back and forth, the energy is not changing. So one can say that if I took a scale, I could balance the kinetic energy at one point plus its potential with the kinetic energy at another point plus its potential energy. So I have a way to weigh the heart and the feather. Now you may say this is forced. Okay, but the idea is that the energy is constant, is conserved, and this, I submit, exemplifies the principle of Mott, the principle of judgment, weighing up the heart against the figure of Mott. Now, but the general idea of the next foil is that abstract things must balance. We find generally these judgment or constant or conservation principles in physics. In physics, they tell us what can be done, not what, what must be done. Next foil, please. Now, let's see if we can see some more illustrations of the principle of Mott in physics. Mass energy. I show at the top expression E plus plus E minus. E plus is a positron, E minus is an electron. They both have mass. On the other side of the reaction, I show a gamma particle. It has no mass. So we've gone from one form to another form. Is something conserved? You betcha, what's conserved is energy. So again, an illustration of the principle of Mott. The next illustration, linear, moment, linear momentum. I, on the first side, if you can bring the foil up just slightly, I show a gun before the bullet is going off. I show a gun after the bullet is going off. What's conserved here? Again, the principle of Mott. The feather equals the heart. Momentum is conserved. The next figure at the bottom, again, we have the principle of Mott operating. Angular momentum is conserved. So again, the principle of Mott, developed by our forebearers 6,000 years ago, is used in modern physics. The next foil. More esoteric still. Here I have a neutron going into a proton plus an electron plus a neutrino. And I'm asking myself, is something conserved? Is there something on one side, like a heart, and on the other side, like a feather? You betcha. What's happening here is that spin is conserved. Spin is intrinsic to each of these small particles. The neutron has to spin one half, the proton has to spin one half, the electron has to spin negative one half, the neutrino has to spin one half, if I add the left and right side, I have heart and feather action. I have one half equaling one half. Uh, in the next expression, I have electrical charge conserved. Again, principle of Mott, developed by our forebearers about 6,000 years ago. Here I'm talking electrical charge. The charge of the neutron is zero. The charge of the proton is one. The charge of the electron is negative one. The charge of the neutrino is zero. Do, it, does the principle of Mott operate? The principle of Mott operates. The heart equals a feather. Zero for the neutron. One minus one is zero. Plus zero is still zero. So again, we see the principle of Mott derived by our ancestors, our comedic ancestors about 6,000 years ago is still operating in modern physics, operating today, operating for all time. Okay, um, now, <clears throat> I had the great pleasure of going to Egypt with Dr. Ben in 1982, and he told me that the fundamental structure of any entity is a threesome, and he was talking about the man, the woman, I got it right, pardon me, the woman, the man, and the child. Next foil, please. Okay, bring it down a little bit. So, the fundamental entity, entity is a trio. We can talk. Mother, Father, Son, Isis, Osiris, Horus, Mary, Joseph, Jesus, Spirit, Spirit, God, Christ, 
spirit, body, soul, or in physics, the three, quart, the three quarks of the hadrons. It's all the same. Three makes one. And I think we have to do a little work on the first one there for the comedians here in the United States. We have to get our families together. We have to spend some time there. But anyway, uh, next point. So the fundamental scheme of nature which is Cometian based, now shows that there are six, uh, six lectons. We can just go right, oh, okay, pardon me. Yes, this is not in my notes up here. Uh, the current pitch of nature is that we have photons, gravitons, leptons, and there are six, and there are six quarks. Mesons are intermediate particles in weight, and they're composed of two quarks. When the quark was originally conceived in the 60s, people thought there were only three quarks to, pardon me, people thought there were three quarks, and that would explain most of matter. They explain presently the protons and the neutrons. Uh, you can skip the next fall, my friend, and go to the one after that. And you can see just by adding charge, now add the, go over to the far right, if you had two-thirds, minus one-third, plus two-thirds, the, the charges of the quarks are these no longer integral multiples of the electronic charge, but n numbers divided by three. If you add two-thirds, minus one-third, and two-thirds, you get one. That's the charge of the proton. If you add minus one-third, two-thirds, and minus one-third, you get zero. That's the charge of the neutron. Next foil, please. Okay, yes, the Big Bang. Um, from, this is from uh, Professor James's work, George G. M. James, James. The ancient Africans were fire, worshiper, fire worshippers because they believed that fire was the creator of the universe. Maybe I can, I think I have this up here, so I'll just read from here. Yes. They built their pyramids and the Fire, of course, means fire in order to worship the god of fire. Fire, uh, as we represent today in physics, is light or heat. And this is the same as modern electromagnetic radiation. Next foil, please. Okay, there at the top I show an equation which we can bypass. And let's bring the bottom part up a bit. Now, Pata and Amun-Ra, the divine artificer fashioned the universe out of fire. This now is the Comedian concept of fashioning the universe out of fire is equivalent to the 1986 concept of the Big Bang. The next foil, please. Now, uh, the, as our Comedian brethren knew, and as we, as our, also the people of the ancient Hindu knew, the age of the universe is about 10 billion years old. Now, what I'm going to do here is divide uh, each of these, I'll divide the years by 10, so I'll go from 10 to 10 billion to 1 billion. Now, can you raise that fall up just slightly, my friend? And I'm going to go quickly through this. So when I divide 10 billion by 1 billion, I get, uh, pardon me, when I divide 10 billion by 10, I get 1 billion. And so each of my steps are dividing by 10. So as I do that, I move up. And towards the Big Bang, the next foil. And by the 39th step, after I've divided 10 billion by 10, after I've divided it 39 times, I'm up to 10 to the minus 22 seconds, a very small time. The next foil, please. After I've divided it by, after I've divided 10 billion by 10, 60 times, I have 10 to the minus 43 seconds, a very small fraction of a second. At this point, uh, gravitation and electronuclear forces are the same in strength. At this point, the universe is less than the size of an atom. The whole universe, the whole schmear, is less than the size of an atom. Okay, now what happened is that this can be explained by the uncertainty principle of the pairs of opposites concept. It'll, uh, because if we consider very small times, almost any, any energy size is allowed, and this energy was the energy it took to fabricate the universe. The next foil, please. Uh, there are many areas of modern physics that I haven't covered. 
such as general relativity. And again here, Einstein used the principle of equivalence, which is an exact replica in that of the principle of Mott. String theory, unified theory, grand unified theory, Kaluza-Klein theory, the Einstein-Rosen-Podolsky paradox, which was written up in the New York Times recently, and nature's fifth fourth. I haven't dealt with that. Uh, excellent sources of reading about this are, as I've said before, I'm not selling New York Times, which is a very good source, Scientific American Science and the New York Public Library. I would also recommend the Library of Congress, but after the Graham Rudman bill passed, it closes on Saturday and Sunday now, and also in the evening. So we're spending our money there to build bombs. Uh, now back to the two questions I asked at the outset. Why is there a relationship between the general principles of ancient comedic science and modern physics. Now it turns out when a problem is solved well, the solution has wide application. Our ancient comedian brethren solved their problems well. We can see this also in physics. In physics, when the harmonic oscillator problem was solved, it was used in quantum field theory, when Newton did his work based upon the Comedian concepts, it was used in general coordinates, Lagrangian mechanics, Hamilton mechanics, Hamilton-Jacobi theory, and quantum mechanics. So again, uh, the ancient Comedians solved their problems well. Now it may be in, in the underlying pattern or simplicities of nature, in the nature of the expanded consciousness of mankind, or in the connection between the two. Our ancient Comedian, Comedian brothers were in touch with both of these. Now about the question, can one use the results of ancient African science to predict the results of modern physics? I submit if one deals on an abstract or conceptual level, it can. In my view, life is a process. The principle of Mott, law, truth, and justice is the way to do science. It's not the way that we presently do science. Now, the last foil, I've taken the words from, okay, well, if you can go back to the previous foil, just a moment. Uh, from James's great book, the purpose of Egyptian mysteries was to make a man godlike by pure factory agencies of education and virtue. Okay, one minute, fine. So let's go to the last foil. Now, my conclusion perhaps doesn't follow from uh, what I've said up until now, but I'm gonna take a moment to preach in my last moment. The black, African, uh, the black African condition is not one of plight, but one of necessity and opportunity. The necessity is to save the world. We are, at, we are the least invested in the present system through accepting African principles or equivalent and acting thereupon. The opportunity is to change the nature of science and economics, as we've talked about earlier, to make them holistic, not left brain, but whole brain, not greed seeking, not greed seeking, but holistic again, not destructive and not materialistic. Thank you. Brothers and sisters, the building and the construction of the pyramid continues. Brother Kamal Anderson, come. Come out. Thank you very much. Come out. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Brother, brother, brother Jones. Um, while he's setting up the slides, uh, I'm filled with humility and, and a lot of gratitude to be before uh, uh, this, this group of African people who uh, is going to call you out if you say something wrong, is going to support you if you say something right. So I hope uh, the statements that I make is going to be in the right vein. Now, 
uh, due to the shortness of time, and I'm glad that it's short, and Naeem went before me because the statements that he made uh, was right on time, and, and that shows the power of this particular group because uh, we had about one minute to say what each of us was going to do. So I can spend most of my time on what my topic is going to be about. That's hydraulics in the Nile Valley because Naeem has already brilliantly explained what comedic science is all about, the philosophy of comedic science. And I'm going to hit upon some of that, but my focus, my primary focus is going to be uh, hydraulics in the Nile Valley. Could we adjust the lights for the slides? Okay. Um, the, title, the title of my presentation is From Celestial Flow to Terrestrial Flow, The Evolution of Ancient Hydraulics in the Nile Valley. Now it is said that Kemet is the image of the sky, where the divine beings sail across, sail across the sky each day on those waters on high. So the Nile River itself has a heavenly, that is celestial, and also an earthly, that is terrestrial, uh, quality. So we will, by necessity, explore both of those qualities for the sake of harmony and balance. So we cannot talk about one without discussing the other. So first, the celestial flow, the creation story. They came, the waters of life which are in the sky. They came, the waters of life which are on the earth. The sky is a flame for you. The earth trembles for you before the divine birth of Osiris now. Now symbolically, this quote was taken from the pyramid text. It is the literary representation of the duality of the Nile River, having both a celestial attribute and a terrestrial attribute. Now Osiris, the god symbol of the Nile River's annual inundation that is flooding, is the son of Nut, the goddess of the sky, and also uh, uh, Geb, the god of the earth. So therefore, he, that is Osiris, was conceived from a celestial and terrestrial union. So each year, thousands of years, the inundation of the Nile was replayed through the creation drama of Asur or Osiris, uh, that is, of death and regeneration, uh, and, and uh, creation and uh, degeneration. Now this creation drama is symbolized by, like I said, the annual flooding of the Nile, and, recede, and the receding of the Nile River waters. And as it does that, it nourishes the valley with the rich nutrient-laden alluvial, alluvial deposits that was life sustenance to the comedic people. Now this inundation of flooding was a natural phenomenon that the annual, that is annual recall the mystery of creation. When all existence suddenly emerged from one cosmic ocean by virtue of one single divine impulse, the flooding of the Nile. Now it is proper that the Nile River is venerated in the creation story because, as we will see later on, the geographical source of the Nile is in Central Africa, in the Great Lakes region, which is the birthplace of humanity. So symbolically, this region, the Great Lakes region, represents the womb of the world and the Nile being the umbilical cord that provided the sustenance of life to the world's first high civilization. Before there was any opposites, any yes and no, positive and negative. Let's focus a little. There we go. As I was saying, before there was any opposition, any yes or no, any positive or negative, before there was anything complementary, any high or low, any light or shadow, before there was presence or absence, life or death, heaven or earth, there was but one incomprehensible power, alone, unique, inherent in the cosmic noon. The indefinable cosmic sea, the infinite source of the universe, 
outside of any space and time. Now, ancient comedic pre-scientists believe that the Nile River originated from this primordial cosmic waters called the noon, the initial state before creation, the Big Bang, as uh, the brother was talking about earlier. Uh, Ra, the sun god, travels across this uh, cosmic ocean in his boat uh, each day as he goes from east to west. The waters of Genesis also can be compared to this primordial state of, of what is known as noon. Now, the Nile was believed to have branched off from this cosmic ocean called noon and traveled down to Earth, overcoming its final obstacle at the seventh cataract, as Dr. Ben has taught us, not the first, if we got our orientation correct, uh, at uh, Aswan. According to the Isis Osiris drama, Isis buried the calf of Osiris uh, at Elephantine, on the island of Elephantine uh, near Aswan. Now this is where the ancient comedic pre-scientists, hydrologists, hydraulics, and metaphysicians believe that the source of the Nile spring from the calf of Osiris. Now we can only accept this, uh, as Naeem was talking about earlier, metaphysically or uh, mythologically or al allegorically, because the ancient texts of uh, King Tahaka of the mighty 25th dynasty tells us that the Nile and inundation was a downpour from heaven in Nubia. And we also have the text of uh, Hunefer, who talking about the origins of the Kemetic people, saying that we came from the beginnings of the Nile, where the god Hopi rings uh, at the foothills, of, the foothills of the mountains of the moon. So, and furthermore, uh, we, can, we can, uh, can only accept that allegorically that the Nile originated at, at Elephantine because we have temples all up and down the Nile uh, uh, further uh, up south of uh, Aswan. Now, ancient Kemetic people believed that no one god could be beneficent enough to bestow all the blessings that they received in the valley. So a god was assigned to the Nile for its blessings, just like there was a god assigned to the sun, Ra. The god of the Nile was called Hopi. The personification of the Nile River as the god Hopi was the first was first done in the so-called first dynastic period by Menes or Nama. Now this is a bas relief of uh, the god Hopi. It depicts the process of genesis, of creation of life. Now as I stated earlier, everything comes from the primordial cosmic ocean of noon. Now in comedic mythology, it is the infinite source. At the time of the inundation, which was singled which was signaled or cued by the helical rising of the star Sirius close to the summer solstice, Hopi, the Nile, acted out the mystery of the beginnings, that is, its flooding and receding. As the flood waters receded, the new or first earth was revealed, and thus new life was created. Now, Hopi is a male god as symbolized by the beard you can see, uh, the characteristic beard you can see, uh, uh, on his chin now. And it, this, he was accorded devotion as the bringer of fertility and all things good, sweet, and pure. Now the single female breast is symbolic of the life-giving nourishment, uh, sustenance, of uh, fertility of the Nile. Now in his left hand, he is holding, uh, offering the harvest of the Nile, the fruits of life, under which you see two unks, which is the keys of life. Now on top of the head of Hopi, you see a grid pattern, which denotes the uh, very uh, sophisticated uh, uh, grid, uh, irrigation uh, patterns uh, you see in the, in the Nile. Now, right above that grid pattern, you see some emblems that assign Hopi to one of the many gnomes or provinces that dates from prehistoric times. Now, the emblems are eight horizontal lines, as you can see there, right above the grid pattern there, a circular impression, and a circular cross symbol. Uh, the circular cross symbol denotes uh, from uh, Dr. Carruthers, uh, town, or uh, gnome, or uh, province. The other symbols is the nexus between Hopi and the creation story. They represent what was called the great Ined, or the nine uh, great gods. The circular symbol represents the god, in this case, a tomb, uh, this particular Hopi was assigned to Heliopolis. Now, a tomb who, who gave birth to himself from himself, and then he created the other eight 
uh, guides, and I don't have to tell you who they are, represented by those horizontal lines there. Now, this bass release of Hoppy, although somewhat rev uh, weathered, is, a, is, is the symbolic greenish type color. Let me focus a little. There we go. The symbolic greenish type color, which is, is, is symbolizes the, the rich fertility or vegetation of the Nile Valley. Now, this is a representation of the inundation of the Nile by Hopi. Now, this bas relief from the Temple of Philae on the island of Philae pictures Hopi watering a basin of vegetables with two streams of water, one from his breast and the other from a vase on his, uh, on his hand. Let me try to focus that a little bit. Okay, there's Hoppy on the left side of the, of the bass release. You can see him one hand holding his breath, watering uh, the basin, and the other hand with, a, with a, 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 a vase in it, also water pouring from it. Now, in, in the basin is some vegetation. Now, top that, on top of that vegetation is the Bennu bird, symbolizing the soul of Osiris rising up out of the vegetation from the sustenance of Hopi into a new life or rebirth. Now in the center is the Ibis head, is an Ibis head uh, Horus, not, not Thoth or Tehuti in this case, it is Horus, characteristic, taking on the characteristic of uh, Thoth, the master of time and also the master of, of scribes, who is also uh, the first month in the comedic calendar, being beginning with the heliatical rising of Sirius or the inundation of the Niles when they, that's when they had their clock set on. So Thoth was the first month and they had 11 other months broken down into the, uh, uh, in their calendar. So on, uh, next to uh, Horus, in, in the symbol of, of Thoth is holding in his hand uh, three vases also. From two of the vases we see the flooding of the Nile, and right in between those, the flooding of the Niles, those two lines, we can see the, uh, uh, a stream of Ankh, which is, which is symbolic of, of life. And what, what Horus is doing is actually pouring libation to his father there in front of the three figures on the, on the right, who is uh, Osiris. And behind him is Isis and Nephthys. Now, Cheek Antadiop in the, his cultural unity and the, uh, uh, Dr. Ben in his uh, Black Man of the Nile has provided strong evidence that there's commonality between comedic belief and uh, uh, common African beliefs all across the country. And these beliefs date back to prehistoric, uh, uh, pre-dynastic times. Now, this is a comedic representation of that principle of twinness or duality. Again, Again, on the left, there we see uh, this bas relief is taken from uh, the temple of Hatshepsut, and it depicts the divine birth of Hatshepsut and uh, Amenhotep III. We see again Harpy on the left there, the Nile god presenting the newborn child and his double, or opposite, the Ka, to his father, Amun-Ra. Now, this principle of double or twinness also exists in Uganda and other regions of Africa. And through the works of uh, Hannah Adams, we find that the Dogon of Mali had the same similar belief of double uh, or twinness uh, or an opposite at the time of birth. Now, Hapi is the celestial connection to the Nile River. He was placed among the comedic gods by the priest. Uh, uh, these ancient pre-scientists to receive the thanks and praises of the people for the annual blessings from the Nile River. Hymns was chanted in reverence to Hopi by the priest to ensure a bountiful inundation or a high water mark from the floods. Now during the time of the inundation celebration which happens each year at the helical rising of Sirius, uh, these prints, these uh, uh, comedic priest scientists uh, chanted to the river, giving it praises or sung hymns to the river. And one such uh, hymn was, Hail to thee, Hopi, who appears in the land and cometh to give life to Kemet, bringing food rich in sustenance, creator of all good things, Lord of all seeds of life. Take his possession of the two lands and the granaries of field. 
The storehouses are prosperous and the goods of the poor are multiplied. Establisher of true riches, hear seducive words in order that thou may reply and answer mankind by ways from the heavenly ocean, the celestial flow. Now, the terrestrial flow. In the late Miocene time, which is geologic time, about 10 million years ago, the Mediterranean Sea had dried up and a river called the Neo Nile or Eel Nile was formed, cutting a majestic canyon from the vicinity of the, from the, vicinity of the present day uh, Nile Delta all the way up south to Aswan. About five to three million years ago, the Mediterranean Sea refilled and the Neo Nile County, the Eel Nile Canyon became a large estuary and began to fill with the marine and alluvial sedimentation coming down out of the mountains. In the late Pliocene period, about two million years ago, the Nile Valley climate was very wet. The estuary, uh, what was the Nile, turned into a channel and began filling with fluvial deposits. About eight to 600,000 years ago, the climate turned dry and the proto-Nile, uh, as we know it today, almost a proto-Nile began to form. Now over geologic time, this early proto-Nile connected with the drainage basins in the Ethiopian's highland and the Central African mountains to form what we know today as the modern Nile. The source of the Nile has eluded uh, Kemetic uh, invaders and colonialists for millennia up until about the 19th century. Uh, but as I, as I mentioned earlier, the papyrus of uh, Hunefer states very clearly not only the source of the Nile, but where the Kemetic people came from. It says, the papyrus Hunefu again says that, we came from the beginning of the Nile, where the god Hopi dwells, in the hill, foothills of the mountain of the moons. So that clearly states that uh, the Kemetic people came, as Dr. Ben and others has taught us, not from, uh, 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 from the north, but from up south, following the path of least resist this least resistance out of Central Africa down the Nile Valley and settling into an agrarian type lifestyle in the Nile Valley and then later creating a high civilization. Now the Nile River has many sources, but there's two main sources. Uh, that's the headwaters of the Blue Nile and the White Nile. Now the White Nile has its sources in the Great, Lake re Great Lakes regions of Central Africa, bordering the countries as you can see on this map here, Rwanda, Burundi, Zaire, Tanzania, and Uganda. The main lake that feeds the White Nile is Lake Inyanza. That's the big blue spot equal to the equator here. The big blue uh, spot in the center of that slide. Lake Inyanza, as I said, not Lake Victoria, as it's been misnomered. Right. Now this is the, the headwaters of the Nile. If you, if you follow the main river that feeds into the Nile, which is Lake Kagara, K-A-G-E-R-A, the Kagara River, the main tributary to the Ny Lake Inyanza, you will come, uh, this is the scene that you will find. This is the headwaters of the Nile. This is where creation begins. This is the initial flow of the Nile River in, the, uh, uh, in Burundi. Now, less a tributary to the White Nile flows from Lake Kivu um, and Lake Mobutu in the, Ro, the Ruwenzori Mountains, and those are the mountains of the moon that we commonly hear about. Now, the Blue Nile headwaters is, uh, flows from Lake Tana in the Ethiopian highlands. Now, these two rivers form the Nile River at the confluence at Khartoum, Sudan. From these two main sources, which perpetuates the African belief system of duality, the river begins its 4,100-mile journey, one-sixth the circumference of the earth to the Mediterranean Sea. The only other significant tributary to the Nile is the Atbara River, which empties into the Nile at Atbara, Sudan. For the next 1,200 river miles, there is no other river or stream that contributes to the Nile River flow. Now this satellite photo of the Nile, Nile Valley, just to give you perspective here, you can see the Nile in the very center of the, of the slide, and up to the upper right there, the little bluish area is the city of, of uh, Cairo. The Nile River Valley is very rich in uh, alluvial deposits. That's the rich uh, sediment that comes down from, 
from the womb of the world in Central Africa and in the Ethiopian highlands and deposited itself in the Nile Valley. And as this satellite photo depicts, the high intensity red areas is, is, uh, is representing the, the richness of the soil or the vegetation. Now this is another shot of the uh, 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 Nile River a satellite photo. Again, you can see the intensity of the red. This shot is of the Nile Delta. Again, Cairo being at the lower right portion of the slide there. And you can also see that the Nile bifurcates, mainly bifurcates. There's a lot of other little tributaries that branches off from the Nile as it passes Heliopolis, uh, uh, Cairo, and so forth. But the two main branches there is the Rosetta branch and the Demietta branch uh, that eventually empties into the uh, Mediterranean Sea. Now the people of pre-dynastic Kemet was practicing agriculture for almost two millennia before the dynastic period. The agricultural practices were based primarily on natural irrigation, that is, let the water flow where it may uh, without any artificial diversion. Now given the pre-dynastic population density of the Nile Valley, the natural irrigation was ad adequate to meet the agricultural needs of the populace. Now as the territory of the Neolithic hunter-gatherer hunter types began to dwindle, that is the desert started drying up due to climatic changes uh, in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in the encroachments of the desert, more people began to converge into this life-giving uh, Nile Valley, increasing the need for greater agricultural production. So canal irrigation, that is artificial irrigation, was developed during the latter part of the pre-dynastic period to alleviate some of these uh, population pressure and to increase the production of agriculture. Now the earliest evidence of canal irrigation is in this base head drawing of the pre-dynastic king scorpion, ceremoniously excavating an irrigation canal in the bottom half of the drawing. We can see uh, the waterway there, uh, and two workmen's digging, uh, helping him excavate uh, the, uh, the network there. It bifurcates, and you can see right behind the uh, workmen at the bottom of the slide is standing straight up a grid pattern. I know it might be difficult to see, but there is a grid pattern there with a palm tree growing out of it, symbolic of uh, the very intricate irrigation networks. Now this drawing clearly shows that uh, not only agriculture, but uh, hydraulic technology, in a sense, is beginning to blossom into a very sophisticated uh, comedic science. Now, hydraulic projects during the early uh, dynastic period increased dramatically, particularly under the ring of Menes, or Narmer. Now, it's been, it has been said that during, before the ring of Narmer, the Nile Valley and the Delta was just a vast swamp. So, Given the number of projects that, that Norma initiated and, and actually successfully built, and we'll talk about some uh, on the next slide, he should be called the father of hydraulic development in the Nile Valley. Now, hydraulic projects was of great significance during the pyramid building age. There's evidence of uh, st uh, stone quarry revetments, uh, canals, large piers, and artificial lake basins along the, uh, the desert edge there at Giza, between Giza and the, the, the town of Abu Sur. Now these hydraulic projects is undoubtedly was used by uh, uh, the king, kings of Pharaoh Khufu, Khafre, and Menkere to help them construct what Western science hadn't figured out, so they call them the wonder of the world, but we know what they are, uh, the great pyramid complex at, uh, at Giza. But there was also uh, uh, dam building going on, a lot of, lot of dam building, but to a very small scale. But the most significant of these hydraulic, uh, the most hydraulically significant of these dams was the so-called Saad El Kafara Dam. And this is the so-called Saad El Kafara Dam, the world's first major hydraulic structure. It represents the first attempt at storing a large volume of water in the history of hydraulic engineering. Now, in the present name given by the uh, Islamic invaders, that is, Saad el Kafara, means the dam of the pagans or the dam of the unbelievers. Now, the structure's original comedic name is going to have to be dug out of history because it's unknown at this time. 
The dam was constructed approximately 4,600 years ago on the east bank of the Nile in the Wadi El Garawa. Wadi is, is essentially a, a depression in the, in the desert there, about seven miles south of Helwan, about 18 miles southwest of uh, present-day Cairo. Now this age put it in the uh, third or fourth dynastic period. The purpose of the dam was to provide flood protection, contrary to what a lot of the, 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 the Euro-Egyptologists are talking about, that this dam was built for uh, uh, water supplies to rock quarries and, 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 and other type of use, but it is unquestionably the first attempt at, at, uh, at flood control, reservoir control, a very sophisticated uh, hydraulics. Now the dam was about 350, 321 feet uh, wide with a crest width of about 179 feet, the crest being at the top of the dam. The height of the dam was about 47 feet. Now over 100 tons of material was used to construct the, the, uh, this particular dam, and it's called an earth field type dam. Uh, uh, so this is the method used to construct this particular dam is still being used today. These comedic uh, priest engineers, priest scientists was on to something. They knew that it would work, but the dam fell very uh, catastrophically before it was completed. This is the right abutment of the dam, and we can see very clearly that on the, on the surface of the dam, well, I guess you can't see very clearly, but on the surface of the dam is rock, square rocks uh, placed on the upstream side of the dam and the downstream side of the dam to prevent the dam eroding away. I got three to five minutes. Uh, the, the, the dam was constructed such that uh, you had one dam on the upstream side, an, another dam on the downstream side. In the middle, you had an impermeable core. And like I say, that's the same technique used by Western scientists to construct uh, uh, their earth dam. This is uh, just uh, show how the dam was breached or how it fell by this catastrophic flash flood. This dam had a spillway also, but we won't get into that. It's, it's more technical stuff. Now, the so-called Saad El Kafaro Dam, there was other dams that was built. Uh, the Lake Morris Flood Control Project built huge dam for flood control. And they had a, Lake Morris was a 40 million acre feet. If you get one acre and flooded with one foot of water and 40 million of those, you had the flood control capacity of these early hydraulic, early uh, kinetic hydrologists. But the most significant hydraulic device of uh, ancient Kemet was this. It's called the Nileometer. It is essentially the world's first river staff gate. This one you see is, is it was two types. This one was cut into the stone at Elephantine uh, near Aswan. The most popular type was this type here. We find on the island of Philae. It is the door in the back. Uh, go through that door and you'll be into the Nile River. So each year at the, the helical rising of Sirius, the, the Nile River will flood and it will come through that door, and you can see on the left side of the slide the scales of the Nileometer measured in uh, cubic units. And as I said, as the Nile floods, it's entered through those doorways, and the hydrologists, comedic hydrologists, would go down into these Nileometers and take a reading off of these Nileometers, and that was a very important reading. The Nileometers was controlled by the government, and uh, taxes was assessed based on the, the level of the high water mark, but not only that, that's not significant, is that this particular uh, uh, hydraulic device set precedent for later river regulation in the West and uh, also in Europe. Uh, once they take a reading of this Nile Armada, they can tell, effectively tell, uh, the amount of sediment that's going to be deposited in the, the floodplains downstream. They can effectively tell whether there's going to be a poor crop or, uh, or uh, uh, a good crop. See, the life ways of the comedic people was uh, directly related to this reading. The Nile Armada was, the, as I said, the property of the government. Now, for example, there was Nile Armada located all up and down the Nile Valley. But at Memphis, if there was a reading of 12 cubics, it would cause a horrible famine. 13 cubics would bring security, 14 cubics would bring a fair season, 15 cubics would satisfy all, 16 cubics would produce unbound transports of joy. 
As I said, that implies a whole lot in terms of sediment transport and hydrology. But we're going to have to move forward because of time. This is another hydraulic device called the shadow. It's essentially, uh, as artificial irrigation was generally in the floodplain, but there was a need for lift devices as more people and, and other types of, of people came into the, the Nile Valley, had to have these lift devices to lift water up to a higher level and irrigate more land. The shadow was introduced around uh, 2900 AFDE, or 1340 BC, uh, to, for just that specific purpose, to uh, irrigate more land. And it can only lift about three to five feet. Again, as population and pressures increased, need for more sophisticated hydraulic devices grew. And this is the sequoia, S-A-Q-U-S-A-Q-I-Y-A, sequoia, another hydraulic type device. Uh, there was other hydraulic type devices that uh, has been produced and other people has gotten credit for it, particularly the so-called uh, Archimedes wheel. Actually, it was called the Tambur, T A M B U R. It was uh, essentially uh, a device where you can stick it in the water and you can screw it like that, and the water will actually travel up these pipes and, and uh, irrigate uh, low lying uh, farmland. Uh, hydraulic development after the Archimedes wheel basically was stagnant. There was more barrages, uh, more sophisticated irrigation systems. But at the turn of the century, the old Aswan Dam was built. This is a picture of the old Aswan Dam on the seventh cataract, which you, you uh, ir Egyptologists call the first cataract. And it helped also uh, in terms of problems of water supply and uh, irrigation. But what, what this represents, what this dam represents, the, the first major step toward reintroducing set, a uh, isfet, a uh, chaos into the Nile Valley because it stepped up the degradation of the Nile Valley and the Nile River. That natural harmony and balance was removed. The Nile is no, more, no longer in that harmonic rhythm with the universe. It's no longer synced with the helical rising of Sirius because of, of this dam, and particularly this dam here. Merely 70 years later, as, after the Aswan Dam was built, I mean the old Aswan Dam was built, we have this monstrosity of, 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 of madness, the Aswan High Dam. Uh, as I said, it reintroduced Set into the Nile Valley. Set has once again taken over Osiris and, and hid him somewhere else. Isis is looking for him, and she will probably find him. Uh, Nile degradation has stepped up tremendously from the building of this particular structure. Uh, as I said, the inundation process has been completely stopped and the Osirian drama is not being played out in the Nile Valley anymore. The only benefits that the present occupants of Kemet is getting from this particular structure is hydropower, if you can call that a benefit. What they're using that hydropower for, for is to, uh, to electrify the chemical, pesticide, and uh, fertilizer industries because the rich alluvial, alluvial nutrient-laden soil is not being deposited in the valley anymore. It's losing its capacity to sustain life because of this that disruption in that process. So uh, uh, the Nile Valley is not being born again. There's no more new life. It's not being replenished because of the Aswan High Dam. And to conclude here, what can be done to return the natural hydraulic rhythm of the Osirian drama to the Nile Valley and rid the evil influence of said typhoon? Can we return the harmony and peace to the Nile Valley that our ancient comedic ancestors experienced in their daily life ways? For us to seriously deal with the hydraulic problems in the Nile Valley, first we must reclaim the land, if you know what I mean. Then a whole new set of scientific paradigms will be needed to restore and maintain the harmony of the Osirian drama in the valley. A holistic approach, the approach that uh, Dr. Akbar was talking about, to scientific thinking must be developed by the African mind, a thought process that integrates the intuitive with the analytical. The ancient comedic scientific paradigms of our ancient ancestors, they acknowledged a supreme creative force. Therefore, science and spirituality was intertwined, interrelated. And we juxtapose that with the West, they totally deny any supreme creative force in their scientific thinking. 
Ancient comedic science admits both material and non-material causes and effects. And of course, Western science denies that. Ancient comedic science recognizes many realities beyond the five senses, meaning that you can, you can, you can become conscious of anything, not, you can become conscious of things not by through seeing, hearing, tasting, or touching, and so forth. There's other ways that these ancient comedic sciences acquire knowledge. Okay, they place, ancient comedic scientists place emphasis on the inner experiences and whole self-learning. That is, utilizing the logical, rational, and also the intuitive spiritual thought processes in the learning experience. And Dr. Naeem Akbar has elucidated on that so clearly that, you know, the only, in Western science, they say the only logical and objective process is the scientific process. If you're not logical and objective, you can't be scientific. And lastly, ancient comedic scientists saw cooperation and harmony with nature. And we know the question on that in terms of Western science. So when we establish these new paradigms, these new scientific paradigms that must be established by these new Africans out here uh, to save not only the world, but possibly the, the, the harmony and balance in the universe, we must establish these new scientific paradigms. It will become clear then that in order to restore and resurrect the natural harmony in the valley, to rid the valley of set typhon, the high S1 dam has to be removed. The high S1 dam has to be removed. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, in concluding, giving thanks and praises as always to Dr. Ben Chikanta Diop and Dr. John Henry Clark and others for having the intellectual courage to resurrect the history of Kemet and Africa from an Afrocentric perspective. Uh, I feel that we must pick up the sword and shield of these valiant warriors and continue to recreate the holistic picture of our ancestral life ways. And with a clear understanding of the hydraulic life ways of not only the people of the Nile Valley, but other river valleys, and Dr. Clark has already made that assignment, he made it last year in Chicago, that we must study the people of other river valleys in uh, Africa. I am sure if we do that, that we can reconstruct and reconstitute our ancient past from an African worldview. If that is done, we will no doubt ensure our future, and in the process, achieve a much higher greatness than our traditional greatness. Asante. Wow. I don't know how we're going to wind down. Everybody's in a state of shock. And because of that, we need to give our brothers a, an appreciative African response to what they have done. And it's important for us to let you know that we will continue with this type of presentation tomorrow. So those of you who made plane reservations and train reservations to leave early, you need to cancel them because we will continue. I'd like to say that we will be going immediately uh, to the uh, feast, which will be on the third floor of the college. And those of you who are not a part of that, there will be meals available downstairs in the cafeteria. It's important, and I'd like to end it and this session with um, this statement. It's important for us to appreciate the historical significance of what has happened here today and yesterday and the day before and what was initiated at Los Angeles and continued at Chicago. With all of that million dollar education that it appears that I have that comes from Columbia University, two degrees including PhD, Lafayette College honor student studying in Switzerland at the University of Lausanne où j'ai très bien le français, je parle le français comme les français. With all of that education that has been mustered on the white side of the ledger, no time in my 49 years has anything ever been presented to me the way it has been presented today by these brothers and sisters. 
And if you don't understand that we are in another level of awakening, that the people on this hill at this university that I'm a part of don't have any idea that we are part of what we're doing. If you don't understand the significance of what has happened today, then you have missed the boat and you better try to catch up. Could we give us all a standing round of applause in terms of our African awakening and consciousness?